So we've come to the end. So first, let me say, Sherelle, thank you. Sherelle has been such a help. And you I mean, it's 1030 in Israel right now. And I know at 1030 at night, how, how you how you keep it together at 1030 at night. I, you know, kola kavod, you're better than me because I'm usually asleep at this point. I mean, 10, 1030 p.m. in Detroit time. Also, Barbara and Norman Rosen, I want to thank you one more time for sponsoring this series. It really, really has been a pleasure uh, and an honor to be part of this wonderful program. And like Sherelle said, I, I hope I'll have an opportunity to do this again in the future. And of course, Nancy Kaplan, I see you out there somewhere. You're the one who made the shidduch in the first place. So thank you again. This isn't the first time that Nancy has hooked me up with some great teaching opportunities. She's been pretty much doing this for me for the last 20 years. And, you know, of everyone, of everyone on the Zoom, I'm pretty sure Nancy's the only one I'm going to see in shul in, in a couple of days. She's the only one on the Zoom who I've called to the Torah on numerous occasions. So thank you again, Nancy. So in our last session today, uh, our main topic is, uh, you know, in talking about the relationship between Jews and American music, a lot of what we talked about is how Jews have contributed, but we've also talked about Jews, American Jews producing original music, and we're going to do a little bit of both today. The, the main thing we're going to talk about is a, is a songwriter and a performer whose name was Debbie Friedman of Blessed Memory, uh, who really pioneered a genre of, of Jewish music that's been nicknamed or has been called or categorized as American Nusach. Nusach is the Nusach is a word for style, but it's the news, it's a or fashion, but it's a word we use to describe Jewish music associated with the synagogue or religious things. American Nusach, as we'll see, what Debbie Freeman is going to do is to create fresh new sounds and songs for religious occasions, transforming the world of Jewish music in America. And we'll get to her in a minute. But before I do that, there is one thing I'd like to do before as a as a kind of add on to last time because last time we were talking about Jews in the folk mu music revival largely for the sake of because of the limits of time there were two important Jewish songwriters I didn't get to and I just want to take a few minutes today to talk about each one because they are very important one is Leonard Cohen that some of you last week mentioned why didn't you mention Leonard Cohen and I'm going to say a few words about him and the other is Peter Yarrow who is Peter from Peter Paul and Mary who, as we'll see, wrote maybe one of the best Hanukkah songs there is, or at least the first Hanukkah song in the style of this, you know, American Nusach. So let me say a few words about Leonard Cohen. You know, he he uh, he's he's most well known for the song Hallelujah, and we'll hear a little bit of that in a minute. But he has a very interesting story. He he grew up in a, a Jewish suburb of Montreal. He was very musical as a teenager. He went to McGill University in Montreal. He was really interested in poetry. He studied poetry. He tried his hand at being a poet. He wrote some good poetry, which just never took on. He had an interesting combination of being both dark, but also hopeful. And that's what a lot of his poetry is about and what a lot of his music is about. He, he uh, after college, when he wasn't really making it as a poet, he returned to music and he began to write just terrific songs. He never had the mass following or the big following that other songwriters did, including some of the ones we spoke about last week. I would describe his following as more of a niche following. But there, there have been people, follow, fans of Leonard Cohen for a very, very long time, for, you know, really beginning in the 70s. Now, he had a breakout moment in the 70s, and I would say that he found a kind of, he expanded this niche fan base first in Israel and then in America. In Israel, the moment he's really known for, and I suppose here too, is during the Yom Kippur War in October of 1973, Leonard Cohen traveled to Israel uh, and, and he performed for Israeli soldiers in between battles. Now, why he did this, he wrote about it afterwards. He was a complicated person. He had a lot of reasons for doing it. Part was to support the soldiers, part because he was very drawn by the by the intensity of the moment. Uh, but he he did it, and, and uh, you know that that moment was has been captured in a one of the best books written about any, things Jewish certainly about Jewish music in a long time called Who by Fire by Maddie Friedman. If you haven't read it, you should definitely read it. But this was a moment where, I mean, it was such a thing to do. And is, Israelis really discovered Leonard Cohen as this remarkable singer, not only the songs he sang there, but his whole sort of catalog. Now, a year after the war in 1974, 
he wrote a song based on that experience, one of his famous songs. And the title of the book about that whole thing was, uh, well, it, 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 it song was called Me by Fire. Now, he, he appropriately, he drew the first line, the, the title of the song, Me by Fire, and the first line of the song is, who, uh, not, it, I'm sorry, not me, who, who by fire, who by water, is drawn from the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur liturgy. You know, if you go to shul on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the, really the centerpiece of the service is the prayer Unitan Etokef, which is this a very powerful prayer. And the climax of that prayer is the chazan and the congregation. And just remember, this is the moment where we're contemplating being judged by God, who will live and who will die. And the, the, the that 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 uh, that pondering really begins with the it begins with who uh, who by fire, who by water, mi ba esh umi ba mai. If for those people who are going to be who are going to perish, how will they perish? And he turns it into us. He turns that into the song. This is a song about the challenges and the difficulty of life, but it's also a song about the resilience of people, and it's also the song. That ultimately, it is a song that finds a ray of hope. I think that's one of the remarkable things about Leonard Cohen is he could be dark, but he was never fatalistic. He didn't settle for that. He was always searching. He was very cognizant of the difficulties of life, but also searching for the ray of hope and insistently finding it. Now, the other song he wrote about 10 years later was a song called Hallelujah, also drawing from uh, the, the prevalence of the term Hallelujah in Jewish liturgy and the Jewish psyche. And that's the song that everybody knows, or most people who know a song by Leonard Cohen, that's probably the one. So let's just give a little listen to... Uh, one of his one of his own renditions of Holly. Incidentally, this is a song that has been covered by so many different artists. I was thinking of having giving you something sung by someone other. You know the uh, the range of musicians who sing this song, from folk singers all the way to John Bon Jovi. I almost played you the Bon Jovi version, but let's listen to the Leonard Cohen version instead. Go ahead. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing. got a lot to get to so we're gonna we're gonna like a little shorter clips today i know it's hard to it's hard to turn off leonard cohen hallelujah in the middle so the other one i wanted to mention from last week and really it's a nice segue to this week is peter yarrow this, this is this is the peter part of peter paul and mary peter yarrow was the son of ukrainian jewish immigrants but they were more affluent they were more educated he grew up in a middle class home he just really discovered his voice in music eventually joined the group peter paul and mary their music was very much part of the folk music revolution of the 1960s but also the protest movement of the 1960s and you know probably two of his most famous songs were of course if i had a hammer which I think was a, 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 their song that they recorded. I want to say it was originally writ written by Pete Seeger, but I got to fact check that. It might have been a Peter, Paul, and Mary. And of course, Puff the Magic Dragon, which he co-wrote. Two, I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. When, when I was a kid, uh, I knew Peter, Paul, and Mary as people who write children's songs. Those were songs we sang as kids before we were old enough to really know the deeper meaning of these songs. But what's interesting is eventually Peter Yarrow, he was writing a lot of these songs about protest about social justice. And thank you, Trini Lopez. Thank you. And um, uh, eventually, you know, he wasn't just someone Jewish being part of this folk music revival. Eventually, he wrote a song which drew something specifically Jewish 
which drew on something very specifically Jewish, which he used as another song about social justice. And this was the Hanukkah song he wrote called Light One Candle, you know, Light One Candle for the Maccabee Children, another really well-known song. But what I urge here is this isn't, this is a great Hanukkah song. And, but it, it isn't only a Hanukkah song. He's writing about the Maccabees as freedom fighters. And he's writing about us listening to the song about the Maccabees as freedom fighters and what that tells us as being concerned about matters of social justice right now. And one of the reasons the song is so popular and so powerful isn't simply because it's a good Hanukkah song. It's because it's a great song from that whole tradition of songs of folk music as protest music, folk music as let's calling for a better world. So let's listen to a little bit of Light, of light One Candle. that answers some of those painful questions. It says, light one candle. A candle on a menorah. The Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. Light a candle for decency. Light a candle for hope. Light a universal candle for peace. Light one candle for the Maccabee children With thanks to their light it didn't die Light one candle for the pain they endured When their right to exist was denied Light one candle for the terrible sacrifice Justice and freedom demand but Light one candle for the wisdom to know When the peacemaker's time is in so many years Don't let the light go out Let it shine through our love and our tears Don't let the light go out It's passing through so many years Don't let the light go out Let it shine through our love and our tears Light one candle for the strength that we need To never become our own foe And light one candle for, for those who are suffering Pain we learned so long ago Light one candle for all we believe in Let anger not tear us apart And light one candle to bind us together With peace is the song in our hearts So many years Don't let the light go out Let it shine through our love and our tears Don't let the light go out Don't let the light go out Let the light go out Don't let the light go out Let it shine through our love and our tears Stop there, Shira. I cut out the verse that verse that Mary is saying, how great is Peter, Paul, and Mary? They're just timeless. Um, but Peter Yarrow and Leonard Cohen, those are our last two examples of Jews really contributing to this larger folk music revival and this whole tradition of protest music. But now I want to pivot to our main topic and talk about the beginnings of this new genre called American Nusach, especially it really begins with Debbie Friedman of Blessed Memory, Zichronali Vracha. And now first let me say that um, just uh, as sort of on a personal note, uh, last week I got an email from Debbie Friedman's sister, Cheryl Friedman, who actually has been part of these programs, who might even be listening right now. And, you know, she actually, uh, so, some a couple of things I'm going to say today are things that she actually mentioned to me. But if I just have to say, it was such a, not only a pleasure, but an honor to be contacted by Debbie Friedman's sister, because Debbie Friedman is simply an iconic person. So let me say, let me say just a little bit about her. And Cheryl, if you're out there, I'm sorry if I get this wrong. But it's not my fault, it's Wikipedia or that other biography website. She was, Debbie Friedman was born in 1951 in Utica, New York. When she was about five years old, she moved to Minnesota. That's where she really grew up, where she really found her voice 
as a Jewish singer, a songwriter, a performer, a, a music teacher, was in the Jewish summer camp movement. So I've got to, I've just got to pause for a second to dwell on the, the revolution in Jewish identity that was the summer camp movement. You know, if we look back on the 20th century and we ask ourselves, how was, how was uh, the American Jewish community able, able to weather the challenges of living in an open society and the and the the problems of assimilation and all of that. There's a list of there's a list of things that contributed to the, the ongoing vibrance of the American Jewish community of community. The summer camp movement is definitely on that list. I'd have to put it in the top five. And Debbie Friedman being a big part of that. So, so first let me say is that the involvement of Jews with summer camps really happened in two stages. First, there were simply summer camps started by organizations by the Fresh Air Society close to the turn of the 20th century. And as the name Fresh Air Society connotes, the purpose of these, of these camps was to give Jewish kids, especially those who lived in cities, a chance to very literally have fresh air, get away from the crowded, musty air of the city. You couldn't see the sky very much. There wasn't a lot of grass. And for health reasons also, give them a chance to breathe air that wasn't full of uh, automotive exhaust. And what, you, know, you know what the, what city air is like. It's not as nice as country air. And so originally these, these summer camps, the only thing that really made them Jewish is that most or all of the kids who went there were Jewish. So that was basically stage one and that was very important. Stage two uh, is, is a, an addition to this summer camp movement in many ways was the brainchild of a rabbi named Mordechai Kaplan. Now, Kaplan, as you may know, was the founder of a movement called Reconstructionist Judaism. And while not that many people have, have become Reconstructionist Jews or join Reconstructionist congregations, his, his, his impact in that sense is relatively limited. But in terms of ideas and in terms of what it means to be Jewish in America in the 20th century, more than anyone else, he's probably the most impactful person. You know, remember I meant that list of things, ways American, the American Jewish community weathered the 20th century. Mordechai Kaplan and his ideas about what it means to be Jewish in America might be the top of that list. He, he I, I give him that much credit. What's very interesting is, like I said, there aren't that numerically not that many Reconstructionist Jews, but Jewish movements across the spectrum, you know, from Orthodox and Chabad on one side to Reform, Humanistic, whatever on the other, everybody uses Kaplan's ideas. In other words, in the 20th and 21st century, American Judaism, more than anything else, is Kaplanite Judaism. He is the one who gave us basic ideas like the Jewish summer camp, uh, the inclusion of women in the service in the synagogue, and the and the concept of a ceremonial, a real bat mitzvah. He's the one who uh, foregrounded Israel as part of the American Jewish psyche. He said to be an American Jew, you must be a Zionist, and you must engage that. And he's the one who also introduced informal Jewish education as an antidote to the limited success of Hebrew school. He said at after school, kids aren't going to learn very much because they're tired and all the other reasons why it doesn't work, why it's never worked very well. And the, the alternate education ideas he came was first was the day school. The concept of the dual curriculum day school in America, that's Kaplan. But the other, the other was a, a, a more informal education. He said, Jewish summer, you know, summer camps, if we give them a Jewish theme, that's where kids can not only learn about what Judaism is, but they can have Jewish experiences. Now you think about summer camps, it's a, it's a weird setting in certain ways. Kids will go there for weeks, four weeks, eight weeks. And one of the things I always found very striking about summer camp, though I didn't notice this until I was older, is there are very few people at a summer camp typically who are over the age of 21. Most of the people running the camp, the counselors, the supervisors are not much older than 20. They're barely adults at all. And on paper, if you think about it, that could easily devolve into Lord of the Flies, into complete chaos, because there really are no real grown-ups around. But the exact opposite has happened for the most part, even though there are summer camps that have had problems. For the most part, it's a system that works, for, for partly because the 19 and 20-year-olds, they step up and take become they become adults in that situation and they become the disciplinarians and the rule enforcers and the role models and all of that, but also because the children for 
some reason, when they're being told what to do by someone who's 19, closer to them, they tend to see that person as, well, that person is cool. That person isn't a grown up. And it, it comes across as less of an order or a requirement or a school class. It's sort of more fun and social and lighter. And so, so much of what happens at summer camp, the atmosphere is so positive. So there were many Jewish kids who really never had much of a positive, let's say Shabbat experience away from summer camp. And they would go to one of these Jewish summer camps, whether it's Olin Sang for, for reform kids or the Ramah camps for, for um or conservatives from conservative congregations or young Judea who are more Israel oriented, whatever it was, and they would have this remarkable experience. It's it's something that has worked for decades. Now, this is where Debbie Friedman came in because she grew up at the reform summer camps, the Olin Sang camps. And she eventually she became the song leader. She was the one who would lead the singing and singing at these camps if you've ever been there, is a very important, is an instrumental part. It's a crucial part of the community building and the experience. And she was a big part of it because she started to write music that was Jewish music that was specifically tailored for that perfect experience. And let me give you an example of the newness of the music that she wrote. Because especially at a camp where they would try to introduce some rituals or maybe a little bit of prayer, maybe singing part of Birkat Amazon, the blessing after the meal. Typically, you think about Birkat Amazon, the prayer you say after the meal. If it's Shabbat or if it's a holiday, you begin with that early, that introductory paragraph, Shir HaMa'alot. And before Debbie Friedman, the most commonly known tune for Shir HaMa'alot was that very Ashkenazic, dirgy sounding tune, Shir HaMa'alot. Now, even if you sing it faster the way kids like to, it's still kind of ordinary sound. It's very Ashkenazic sounding. It's very, you know, it's not, not exactly the, it's not exactly the music they would hear on the radio doesn't have a popular music sound. It has a very specifically Jewish music sound. So she wrote a song, a, 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 a folk version or a folk tune for Shiro Malo. So just imagine if you're a, you're a teenager, you're a camp, the only tune you've ever heard for Shiro Malo is that dirgy tune I just sang. And then you go to camp and Debbie Friedman is the song leader and you hear this. Go ahead, Shiro. So it's a folky tune, but musically it also integrates, integrates a kind of, I guess I would call it a Texas bouncy blues part of it as well. But you got to picture kids clapping, pounding the table. They never heard a tune like that before. Never mind, just not for Shira Mullet. A Jewish song that sounded like that was absolutely revolutionary. Now, she's probably most famous, most well-known, first of all, for the Havdalah tune that everybody sings. Lai, 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 lai. That's a, Debbie, that's a Debbie Friedman tune. Not by might, not by power, with great clapping in the middle. She wrote great children's songs. But she had the, she had the gift, she had the knack of being able to listen to music that wasn't Jewish and turn it into a Jewish song. And it could be lose, music from different styles. So, for example, we just heard a style, of, a, a style an example of her taking music that's folksy and bluesy, turning into Shira Mala. She could do it with more highbrow music as well. So if you've ever heard Paco Bell's Canon, which I know 
if you're if you're younger, you know it as the GE light bulb commercial song. Uh, you know, you know, pocketbooks that that slow, solemn march. She took that tune and she turned it, and she uh, she used that tune and wrote a variation for the lyrics Hodu Lado Nike Tov. So her Hodu is based on Paco Bell's canon. Let's take a listen. One of my favorite things about that song is that at the end, lest we have any doubt that she's that she's using Paco Bell's cannon here, she has Paco Bell's cannon playing on the bells at the end. A magnificent adaptation and just a kind of Jewish music that you just don't find. Now, she's also, I mean, she was at a, a reform summer camp. And one of the things that differentiated reform summer camps from conservative and orthodox camps was that they, they were allowed to use musical instruments on Shabbat. So she, she was able to sing a song like this on Shabbat. At, at, at a place like Ramah, Orthodox camps, music on Shabbat had to be without musical instruments. But Debbie's Friedman, Debbie Friedman's music would work during the week. And I can, I, I can attest from personal experience, you know, I went to Ramah camp, half the music we sang was Debbie Friedman's music. Let me give you one other example of how she could take a popular song and put it in, and, and put it into one of her own songs. She wrote a number a number of different tunes for the for the phrase or the for the verse Micha Mocha Bailim Adonai. Uh, Micha Mocha Bailim Adonai is originally in the Book of Exodus. It's part of the Song of the Sea, crossing Yam Suf, but it's also incorporated into the liturgy. It's a, it's an important moment in the liturgy where everyone rises in preparation for the Amida prayer. And she wrote several ones, and one of them. Uh, and this is an insight I got from her sister. Thank you. One of them, the the musical inspiration was a song by the group, um, uh, the 70s uh, pop band America called A Horse With No Name, which she turned into, she borrowed some of the tune and turned it into this version of Micha Mocha. Let's give a listen.
up to the end. Now, like I said, she's not using the exact tune. This is called composition modeling. So I don't know if you heard, you know, I've been through the desert on a horse with no name. Da, da. It's it's borrowed. It, you know, you can sort of, if you listen to it, you can sort of hear it. Um, but but that that's where she got the idea. Now, I could spend a lot of time, I could spend the rest of the time just talking about the Debbie Friedman song because there are so many good songs. I'm going to play one more toward the end. Um, but I want to spend a few minutes talking about her impact because she really is the dean and really the, I mean, the found, the person who founded this new sock, but naturally her music was so pervasive and so impactful that very quickly created, well, led others to write music like this, to write Jewish themed music using the folk and pop sounds of the 1960s and the 1970s. And I want to give a couple of examples. First was a pop group that was called Safam. Um, now, Safam is a Hebrew word, which means mustache. I was never sure why they were called Safam, other than all of those cheesy 1970s mustaches. No offense if you had a cheesy 1970s mustache, but they're very 1970s. So if you remember what the 70s were like, it could be a little bit cringy, but they wrote this great song about Jerusalem. Uh, uh, and this is very much using the Debbie Friedman method of writing about a Jewish theme using the pop and folk and folk sounds in this case of the early 1970s so let's give a listen let's give a listen to safam's jerusalem that song when I was a kid I grew up in the 70s you know I was too young to really know how cheesy the song was but good kind of cheesy good good song now the other song that Safam wrote they tried to write a, as good a Hanukkah song as Peter Yarrow so they wrote a song called Judah Maccabee it's good not quite as good but it's it's that same kind of pop sound so Safam is one group very much as sort of uh the part of the air of or the people who built on what Debbie Friedman created Another one really came out of that same summer camp movement. And she went to the Olin Sang camp. She, that's where her involvement was. And her two, let's call them her two disciples, it from that camp was a was a uh, someone uh, uh, was was someone named Jeff Klepper and Dan Friedlander. One became a rabbi and one became a cantor. And for the life of me, I never remember which, but it doesn't really matter because they have great voices. They recorded a series of, I would call them Debbie Friedman-esque songs under the name Kolbeseder. They, they were part of this folk or pop duo or Jewish pop duo called Kolbeseder. They wrote great songs. And like Debbie Friedman, they were able to take, you know, modern American tunes that kids would love and they would put them to Jewish verses. They have many, many examples. Lo Alecha is one of them. The, the list goes on. The one, though, I want to mention is Modeani. Is the prayer, is the tefillah that one recites right upon waking up in the morning, and their version of Modani the Fanecha. You know, when, you know, when I when I was uh, when I was going to day school, we had this very sort of old-fashioned Ashkenazi sounding and then a little older, I heard the Kol Beseder version of Modani, which was something you could really clap along to and you know rock along to. So let's listen to the to their version of Modani, which I think they're performing. Yeah, let's 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 listen to their Modani. Shechezarta, be nishmati. 
So what makes this song Debbie Friedman-esque is a couple of things. First of all, the, the chord structure. One of Debbie Friedman's favorite chords, if you know anything about music or tonality, she would use the four of four chord. So if you're in the key of G, it would be the F, or if you're key of C, it would be the B flat. That was a common Debbie Friedman chord progression, and Cole Becerra used that. It's a song where the melody is very singable, but the harmony is also very easy. It's easy to clap along with. Uh, you know, I had some experience being a song leader myself at Camp Ramah, and this was one of those songs where the Chadar Ochel would absolutely rock. Kids loved this song. It was easy enough to sound good singing, and that was really part of the Debbie Friedman secret sauce, is you write a great song that's, that's a, that has a popular sound to it, that, that maybe have, has Hebrew or Jewish words, and is easy to sing and to sound good with an easy harmony so that kids or who's ever singing the song can not just sing it, they could sound good. And, and, and originally these, these were songs for summer camps, but then they became, they became songs for, uh, for Hebrew school or day school choirs or choruses. They were very, very singable. And, you know, and Kolbe Seder really was, they, they were these two guys who were really two of her main disciples. And a lot of their music is, it's original, it's definitely their music, but th they'd be the first to admit that they really are writing in the image of Debbie Friedman. They are her disciples. Now, the individual who took it maybe a step further was someone who actually is from your neck of the woods if you're from California, and this is Craig Taubman. Uh, now, he, he also very much in the very much in this musical tradition, this American Nusach, this Debbie Friedman musical tradition. He came out through the summer camps in L.A. Uh, he's also a magnificent performer, uh, charismatic. He actually, he was, he was the, at Camp Ramah in Canada, where I was the song leader, he was the song leader too before me. So in some ways, I was kind of riding his wake when I was doing it. Now, he, he, he used that Debbie Friedman method of, you know, taking popular tunes and applying it to Jewish verses. I would say he, he, he pushed it a little further. Some of the songs that Craig Taubman wrote some of the some of the Hebrew music he wrote wasn't only pop or folky, it was also had a more rock and roll feel to it. He had a rock and roll band with with the bass and with the drums and had that rock feel to it. His first big rock song was Romamu, not the one he used for Friday Night Service, but his older one. In fact, he he debuted that at Camp Ramah in Canada in I think in 1981 or 1982 or something like that. A great tune. But I think, you know, you know, Craig, he had a great musical ear and musically he was very bold. So there were other styles that he was able to incorporate into this Jewish music. So, for example, he was the one, I think, who first successfully incorporated even some soft jazz motifs into Jew into this sort of Jewish music, which you can hear in one of his early big hit songs, a song that's called Altira, Altira mi pachad pitom, which is a which is a, a verse from the book of Psalms, but it's also incorporated into the liturgy. It's something recited at the very, very end of the service. Uh, so let's listen to a little bit of Craig Taubman's al -Tira. Dava, Dabru Dava, the 
Great tune. I remember. Everyone loved to sing that song. Terrific song. It was the big hit of the Zimriya that summer. Um, now, with all this, with, with Craig Taubman and Colt Besetter and Debbie Friedman and all this music and the other people who were really part of this new school of music, it got kind of a jolt or it found a new forum to be performed when uh, it was kind of, uh, well, it borrowed something from another another st stream within the American Jewish community that was really making a splash at the end of the 1970s. And this is the music of Shlomo Karlbach. Now, Karlbach, I didn't include Karlbach here because there's nothing very American about Karlbach. It's very Jewish music. Uh, it's very Hasidic music. Uh, and so it's really not part of this, you know, uh, American Jewish music culture, but it was very impactful. But for our purposes, Karl Bach introduced two things which are going to be incorporated in, not so much by Karl Bach, but by others. First of all, Karl Bach introduced really uh, the use of musical instruments, uh, especially his guitar music, at Jewish, at, at Jewish occasions. So Karl Bach was observant. He, he wouldn't play the guitar on Shabbat, but he would he would play. He would have guitar accompanied uh, you know, musical moments before Shabbat started. So there would be like the pre-Shabbat sing-alongs where he would introduce a lot of his music there. But he, he wrote tunes that sounded good with the guitar, but also a cappella. But what I think Karl Bach is going to what they're, what what the what others like like Greg Taubman and Kolb Seder and Debbie uh, Debbie Friedman and others what they're going to imitate from Karl Bach is taking Kabbalah Shabbat the Friday night service which for uh, in many congregations and in many places maybe everywhere other than summer camp is really was really never that popular they didn't get the big crowd there uh, uh, except maybe Karl Bach and except at summer camp. But Karl Bach said, if you make it a, a better musical moment, then more people will come. And so we have the new, the new phenomenon, I guess we'd call it Friday Night Rocks or Kabbalah Shabbat Rocks, where you'd have the musical instruments becoming part of the service. Uh, and that's, a very, that's incorporating not so much the sounds of Karl Bach, but the way Karl Bach would make, Jewish, make his music more exciting. Uh, music you can not only sing to, but also dance to. And... Uh, and, and these these songwriters that we've been talking about, they began to fashion their own version of this Friday night service. And, and there are many examples. Cole Besader certainly did it. But Craig Taubman also did one in L.A., which was very, very successful. Now, he, uh, the music he wrote were, were, were music specifically for Kabbalah Shabbat. And the tunes he wrote, some of them were like his other newer tunes. But in Karl Bach, in, in Craig Taubman's Friday night service, we really see uh, it's almost a kind of coming full circle because he wrote a tune for Lechad Odi. Lechad Odi, of course, is the central prayer of the Friday night service. He wrote a tune for Lechad Odi, which in many ways, it has a very klezmer sound to it. And this is what I mean about coming full circle, where you have Debbie Friedman bringing Jewish music in line with the folk and pop music. And then it's pushed a little farther, a little further by Craig Dahlman with rock music and jazz music. But in the context of this Friday night service, there's a kind of return to this, a very classical traditional Jewish sound, a very klezmer sound. So here's Craig who knew how to make music really rock in a more modern American sounding way, writing a klezmer sounding tune and really blending all of that together. So let's listen to this klezmer sounding uh, Lechado D that Craig Taubman wrote. <laughs> Lechadodi, <laughs> 
So I would say two things here. First of all, that very klezmer sounding music would not have been as impactful and, and, and popular, especially among younger people, if it had been introduced by someone who hadn't established their bona fides as a modern, cool songwriter like Craig Taubman. But this was a very popular song. The other thing I'm saying is, and this is nothing against, this is not to diminish Craig Taubman or Safam or Kolba Sator or anyone else, but without Debbie Friedman, none of this is possible. She's the one who laid the foundation for the fusing of Jewish music and these other sounds. She is the one who made it possible. And I, I, I cannot give her enough credit for it because without her, none of it happened. She really was the pioneer. There's one last aspect of her music I want to mention. And, and a common theme in her music and in other music as well is writing music, not only, not only Jewish music, but more specifically about Jewish women. Because this musical sound, this genre, this American Nusach is really coming of age at the same time when, uh, especially in the conservative movement and even to some extent in the Orthodox movement, the whole situation is becoming more egalitarian or in general, this notion that, of, that women should be fully included in all facets of Jewish life. And in terms of, in terms of pondering and reflecting on the Jewish past, this is when we have scholars and others who are thinking about a particular women's brand of spirituality, a particular women's story or narrative from the Tanakh or from the Midrash. This is a this is a, a, a large area of inquiry for intellectuals, for for clergy, for in, in many many ways. And Debbie Freeman, I mean, one of the, her last contributions uh, musically to this expansion of the whole understanding of what Judaism is and was, is this celebration, not only a celebration of the Jewish woman, but making it very clear that without a real appreciation and, under, and understanding of what it means to be a Jewish woman, one's understanding of Judaism, past and present and future, is incomplete. And really, this was her final contribution. And she wrote a number of songs, a lot, you know, in this vein. But I think her, I, I think the one that really, uh, really sets that, really illustrates and epitomizes this this contribution is the song she wrote called Miriam's Song. Now she's writing about Miriam, the sister of Moses, who in the Bible, it, it, you know, she's not mentioned very much. She's almost a supporting character, but subsequently in the Midrash and certainly in the 20th century, the character and the importance of Miriam, Miriam's well, Mir the, her significance is, is just been amplified and amplified and it exemplifies that, that this, this way to have a more complete understanding of what it means to be Jewish, of the Jewish people, of th that layer which had largely been downplayed or forgotten is fully rehabilitated in the celebration of Miriam. And, and, and uh, Debbie Friedman's song about Miriam is an important example of this. So let's listen to a little bit of Miriam's song by Debbie Friedman. <laughs> She wove was one which sang our history With every thread and every strand She crafted her delight A woman touched with spirit She dances to the light And the women dancing with their timbrels Followed Miriam as she sang her song Sing a song to the one whom we've exalted Miriam and the women danced and danced all night long The 
never thought the sea would part with an outstretched hand and we would pass the freedom and march to the promised land Hello women dancing with the timbrels Follow Miriam as she sang her song Sing a song to the one whom we've exalted Miriam and the women danced and danced all night long And Miriam the prophet took her timbrel in her hand And all the women followed her just as she had planned And Miriam raised her voice with song she sang So that brings us to the end of the series. So we've seen a lot. We listen to a lot of music. And I think you'll agree with me that in the 20th and 21st century, the variety of Jewish music is just overwhelming. I mean, we produce a lot of different kinds of music. One of the one of the threads that runs through this series and one of the threads that runs through Jewish music. In many ways, this isn't just music. This is how Jews approach a culture or whatever culture they happen to be in, is they're able, first of all, to participate in this larger world without necessarily seeding a sense of Jewishness, but also to contribute to it and add to it and, en and enhance it in a lot of ways, in ways that not only Jews can appreciate, but others could appreciate as well. So in many ways, in Debbie Friedman, we bring to an end a tradition of Jewish music that we started way, way back when with Yiddish theater and Irving Berlin. It comes, it comes, it really, it comes to a full, to reach a high point, to reach a, an important moment in the music of Debbie Friedman. So, so thank you everybody for, for listening. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I wrote in the chat that it's now open to everyone. So if people want to ask or comment, I will uh, ask one question. Um, and that is, uh, if you look now at Jewish American music, like, and you had to point us to in the direction of who, who should we listen to now? What are the next voices? Oh. Uh, um, this will be a preview to your next session, I think. <laughs> well, so. I think I, I, I think the most interesting and the newest mu Jewish music being written now is, first of all, music being written by Jews of color. Uh, for example, uh, Jews who are Jews and uh, who are also black, bringing, um, for example, rap music, but also their own experiences being part of these two communities. Uh, there are uh, Jewish rappers who are black, the other is, is, is Jewish rappers who are Orthodox or who are religious. So for example, there is a Jewish rapper whose name is Matis Yahu. Now he's an acquired taste. So he's he, he's combining elements of rap and jazz. You know, I happen to have a chance to meet him because before he was Matis Yahu, his name was Matt Miller. Who else is going to turn into Matis Yahu before he became before he became Baal Tshuva? And his his sister went to the college where I was teaching. So I, you know, I got to I got to have that encounter. Uh, so, so that's that's certainly one direction. Um, I think there's going to be more of a fusion between Jewish music in America and Jewish music in Israel. There's going to be a broader appreciation because, really, if, if the I mean, some of the most interesting music is being produced, Jewish music is being produced in Israel right now. And I, I think until the age of streaming, it wasn't as available as it is now. But a lot of that is becoming more available in the age of YouTube and other platforms. Jews in America will have more easy access to Israeli music, even though there's been some access. And in many ways, that's a whole separate, a whole separate vein. But I think that that's another one as well. Um, I, I also think that uh, music coming, you know, music being written by Jews who are Jewish and members of the LGBT community, right, using music to express their experiences and their part of the Jewish, uh, their, their part of uh, the Jewish world. And lastly, the mainstreaming of uh, music like Karlbach. Karl Bach has reached a much broader audience. The fusion of Karl Bach music and Debbie Friedman style music. The first songwriter I know who's really done that, I think is very, he's pretty, he's relatively new. His name is Josh Warshawski. 
And his music is probably, I would say, 70% Debbie Friedman, 30% Karl Bach. I think he's the first one to really make that kind of synthesis, but I don't think he's going to be the last. Beautiful. So thank you very much. I'm going to echo the comments in the chat of uh, an amazing course, an amazing series. All of you here are members and I'm going to show you something so you're aware of this that exists for you on our website. So I just want you to see if you go on our website to the members only, you'll see here 23rd uh, CSP Scholar event videos and here you can access uh, we still need to add the last one of this and now today's, but you can access as members all of these videos in a clear and easy way. This is just one example for things we're working on to, to help you as members enjoy uh, the content. And if you didn't believe me about March being an amazing month with amazing content, you can go up to the website website and check out some of our upcoming stuff. So those are uh, just a couple new things and a lot more to come. Howard, thank you so much. Really uh, kind of unbelievable um, what you did here and what you gave here and your ability, not only the knowledge, but also the ability to to pass it on to us in such a beautiful way. So thank you. Take care, everyone.